Well, hello everyone. I wanted to go ahead and uh, uh, put together a, a full-blown lecture video dealing with this material on eyewitness identification. I have talked to some classes about part of this before, so some of it is repeat material, I realize, but I wanted to make sure you got all the material covered as I wanted it covered and that you would have it available when we uh, uh, get ready for our next quiz, our next test, and so on. So let's go ahead and get started, okay? Uh, when it comes to eyewitness testimony, uh, I have done work as a forensic psychologist. I really have. And it is amazing to me how a courts uh, are full of jurors who a lot of times look upon eyewitness testimony as one of the most uh, influential, best source of information you can have in a trial. You can put a person up on a witness stand who turns around and says with great honesty and great assuredness, that's the person who committed the crime. That's the individual who did it. I have no doubt in my mind. That's the person who accosted me, you know, 14 months ago in a dark alley in the middle of the night. Which, if you think of the last three things I said, there's a time element, the, the environment element, and, and things like that. How can you be so sure? The truth of the matter is that uh, research has proven time and again that eyewitness identification and eyewitness memory is very unreliable very unreliable it, it is uh, it's highly imprecise and simply put the stakes couldn't be higher because you're talking about the possibility of someone going to prison for being wrongfully accused of a crime I mean, that that has and can happen and so what we're going to do is we're going to turn around and talk about why memory fails us why people aren't good at it and they don't know why they're not good at it they think they are and a lot of times they find out they are not okay now, one of the first people I want to mention is the work of a woman by the name of Dr. Elizabeth Loftus. Dr. Loftus, she is something of a pioneer in the field of eyewitness identification and memory. All right. And if you look through the book, it talks about encoding, storage and retrieval, encoding, storage and retrieval. Well, she has developed her own theory of why we are not good at eyewitness identification based off of these elements, encoding, storage, and retrieval. The first element she looks at is the encoding phase. She refers to it as the acquisition phase. And simply put, the acquisition phase is the actual event, the perception of the actual event, when it occurs, when you see it, when you hear it, and so on, all right? It is at this time that information is often encoded and placed into memory, right? The next major phase is called the retention phase or the storage phase. And it is during this time, <clears throat> excuse me, it is during this time that we tend to turn around and uh, uh, it is the time between when we encode it and put it in there and store it to the time that we pull it back out. And um, if you've taken part in my in-class demonstration, people were allowed to encode information, store it for, for mere seconds, seconds, not even minutes, but seconds, and then required to bring it back out. And if you were part of the in-class demonstration, you saw how uh, inaccurate that can be for some people, all right? Uh, <clears throat> a lot of times storage can last seconds but most of the time it's minutes hours days or weeks later months later before you have to pull it back to surface and there can be some very serious questions as to its overall accuracy at that time the longer something stays in there the more chance that it can degrade or it can be altered and you don't even know it we'll talk more about that shortly and then finally there is the retrieval phase and it's during the retrieval phase that you bring things back out Okay, all that information is stored is brought back to surface. So you have the encoding, the storage and retrieval, or as she puts it, acquisition, retention and retrieval. Know this, there can be problems that affect factors rather that affect your memory at any of these three stages. Something may go wrong in the acquisition stage and information is not uh, encoded properly. Something may go wrong during the retention stage. It stays in there, it begins to decay after a while. Something may go wrong with the retrieval phase if someone has introduced outside information and it's causing you to change what it is, all right? So know this theory. Very quickly, let me talk about the acquisition phase. 
when you are taking in information, all right, most times this is a very complex event. We're talking eyewitness identification. It's a very complex event. You know, someone coming in wearing lots of, uh, there may be multiple colors, there may be multiple people, there may be multiple things going on. There is a lot of information to encode, all right, to commit to memory. And research tells us that we are really not very good at doing that. We tend to encode very little of the information that is actually acquired and retained, all right? We don't commit a lot of it to memory. We may be exposed to it, but we don't commit it to memory. Um, and therefore, we're a lot of times guessing later on when we're trying to pull it back out if that's accurate or not in that regard. Uh, the truth of the matter is that this whole process we're not very good at committing things to memory. And, and what we do commit to memory, we tend to focus on certain details. And sometimes those details matter, and sometimes they don't. They're irrelevant, all right? And so we end up missing important things because we don't think them important enough. No one consciously says to oneself, hey, I've just witnessed a crime. Let me go ahead and commit to memory this factor, this factor, this factor, and this. We don't think in those terms. Um, and because of that, we can miss things. So this, this is one of the big problems with acquisition. In terms of retention, once information is stored, all right, once it's put in there, people don't realize it can be changed. People don't realize it can be altered unknowingly. People are, sometimes are not good at this and they don't even know why they're not good at this, all right, because there can be outside events. Maybe you have a conversation with somebody uh, and they turn around and you remember the car in an automobile accident to be, to be a, a red car. But uh, you hear other people talking about how it was sort of an orange car, a burnt orange. It might cause you that when it comes time to turn around and uh, uh, describe to the police or law enforcement the accident, uh, assuming the vehicle is no longer there, you might alter what you originally perceived it to be because of outside information coming in, all right? That's one of the examples. You start a conversation with someone and incorrectly talk about the details of the event, and so you alter it. You know, what I see a lot in doing forensic psych is that someone stores something in memory and then they see a story on Facebook or they see a story on social media or on television or they read about it in a newspaper and they convince themselves that that is the person that committed the crime, that is the person that committed the heinous act and so on and so forth. And so they turn around and they alter it. You know, they've, they've seen it and they alter the story or they're convinced. Um, I had one case of a gentleman who turned around and uh, was assaulted. He was knocked unconscious from behind and was actually lying in bed. This is a true story. And um, he was lying in bed in a hospital bed uh, being treated. And he looked up, he had been unconscious in and out for a couple of days. And he's watching the news. And the news story is actually of him. And they had a picture of the man whom they caught uh, and said, so-and-so, such-and-such has been charged with the crime. So and they had this guy's picture up there. So when it came time to talk to the police and the police showed him all these photos, guess who he picked? He picked the person he saw on television, when in reality, he never saw him at all. But he was absolutely certain that was the person, all right? Information and memory is altered. And then you see, finally, a person unknowingly commits the errors to memory. They put them in there wrong to begin with, and they accept them as fact and don't even realize they've done it. So acquisition and retention are probably the two biggest areas where problems can occur. Let's talk about this failure at acquisition. There are two particular variables during acquisition that really influence later recall. One is what we call event factors. Event factors are, uh, relate to uh, things with the actual scenario within the event that can cause you not to remember things well. The second, is, and I'll give you some examples here shortly. The second is what we call witness factors. And witness factors refer not to that which is going on around you when you're trying to commit something to memory, but that which is going on within you 
Okay, something about you as the person committing things to memory, you as the witness, uh, something happening to you can influence this and cause you not to commit things to mem memory properly or possibly to adjust them. So let's start talking about each of these. Event factors, okay? When it comes to event factors, uh, there are a number of things that can really have an impact upon it. And one is what we call time exposure. Simply put, with time exposure, what it means is this. The longer an event goes, the better you are at remembering details of that. If it lasts 10 minutes or 15 or 20 or 30 minutes or an hour, the more apt you are to remember details related to it. Unfortunately, most criminal activity, such as being robbed and things of that sort, do not happen over a period of hours. Usually they happen in a period of just seconds to maybe a minute or two or less. And so the inverse is true. The less time you are exposed to an event, the poorer your memory tends to be. And considering that so many crimes happen very quickly, it really isn't any wonder that people probably aren't that good at remembering things. They think they are, but studies tend to find not so much. Frequency. I include this one, though it doesn't always matter as much. Frequency simply says this, the more frequent something occurs, something is said, something is done, if it's done multiple times, it stays with us better. Repetition increases memory. The problem with frequency is that most criminal activities happen once. They just happen once. Someone robs us. Someone steals our bag, our purse, our wallet. Someone uh, commits a crime, whatever it may be, and then... It only happens once and they're gone. So we don't have a lot of time to uh, uh, commit to memory in so much that it is a singular event. So the lesser the frequency, the poorer the memory. And many, many criminal activities uh, in terms of eyewitness identification only happen once. Detail salience. Detail salience refers to the fact that people tend to remember things better if certain details really stand out, really stand out, they really stand out from the norm, we tend to remember things a lot better, okay? Um, individuals, uh, you know, things are pretty um, boring. If there's nothing that really stands out from the norm, it's harder to remember. Just to say that someone was wearing a pair of blue jeans and tennis shoes and, uh, just a, a, a blue shirt or a red shirt, you know, you might not remember the details properly. If someone's wearing a, a zebra colored jacket, that, that can, you know, you remember that. It stands out. It doesn't pass by as quickly. In fact, I've been told by law enforcement that uh, they love tattoos on, on criminals because they're, they're, they're like wearing a name badge, you know, that says, hi, my name is so-and-so. It really stands out. And sometimes witnesses to crimes will turn around and describe in detail a, a particular tattoo that a person has on their neck, that they have on their face, that they have on their shoulder, that they have on their forearm. Uh, and if it really is something out of the ordinary, uh, people tend to remember it better. Salient, salient. It passes on by if it's boring and dull and so on. But if it really stands out from the norm, people tend to remember it better. So, you know, that's one of the fascinating aspects of uh, tattoos. A lot of law enforcement, they love tattoos because it really helps uh, in doing an identification. What kind of facts are we talking about? Studies have found that if certain facts matter to you, you tend to remember them better. If you know a lot about guns and firearms, you tend to remember what type of firearm was pointed at you. If you know a lot about clothes, um, if you know a lot about cars or automobiles, you tend to remember those details a lot better, it, the, depending upon the importance of the facts, all right? If you don't know much about cars, if you don't know much about clothes, if you don't know much about uh, uh, firearms, you know, you, you tend to be poor at memory. But if the fact is something that you know a lot about and have a past history, people tend to do better with those. Violence versus nonviolent acts. Research tells us that people tend to remember violent acts far more than nonviolent acts. 
violent acts tend to get us to pay more attention. If there's an assault, if there's a fight, if there's a shooting going on, we tend to remember things uh, far better. I've uh, joked with the students in class, if you want to rob a bank, you don't turn around and come in and start firing your gun into the ceiling to get everyone's attention. You do it very quietly, all right? Um, some people who have robbed banks, I understand, you know, they have a little note. They have a gun hidden under their jacket. I'm not telling anybody to rob banks, but they come up to the counter and they hand the note over. Um, and, you know, it says, I, I have a gun. Please put money in a bag. And then they quietly walk out. As I understand, there have been people that when this has happened, others in line who are busy looking at their phone or looking around, completely unaware of this quiet, calm event. And so they don't pay any attention. They don't commit things to memory. So the more violent things are, the more we tend to focus on committing things to memory. If it's nonviolent and nonchalant, we don't worry so much about memory in that regard. And then finally, how long do things take? Research has told us that in estimating uh, how long something goes on, by and far, without a doubt, people tend to overestimate. They tend to think that events go longer than they actually do. All right. So something worth noting. These are not the only event factors by any means. There's six of them here, and they're just ones that I wanted to include in this lecture. I could probably put in another 15 to 25 of them and get really detailed. But for now, these six are a good example. The other category I want to talk about are what are called witness factors. Witness factors, I say again, refer to elements of the individual and how they act and how they carry on and what's happening to them and their influence on a person's memory. For example, stress. I'll show you here shortly, but um, I'll mention this at the end again. But stress, uh, studies find this, that if you are more aroused, more energetic, more awake, you can be better at paying attention to details. But if you are too over-energized, all right, anxiety levels going through the roof, we actually tend to be poor at memory, at memory, all right? I say that again. Up to a certain point, being uh, full of energy and arousal can be helpful. If you're too energized, too stressed, too over, uh, when I say too much anxiety, it actually is detrimental. And once again, I have a chart for that. I'll show that to you here shortly. Weapons focus. This is a fascinating one where people, even if they don't have a background in knives and guns and things like that, if someone is pointing a weapon at you, all right, and therefore a possibility exists that you might be injured or killed, people tend to focus on weapon all right they tend to focus on the weapon and so what can happen sometimes is that people can give you quite the description of the gun or the knife or whatever they're using to threaten you and if they're so busy focusing on that that that, mean, that often means they're not focusing on eye color hair color height weight build uh, tattoos any other uh, discerning uh, marks on the individual you're too busy looking at the weapon and, and that happens a lot. People don't even think about it. We could talk about expectations. Any kind of expectations you have of, uh, from your past or uh, from a particular culture uh, or you just have a personal prejudice against certain people um, can influence the possibility of individuals turning around and uh, uh, not doing a good job of remembering. For example, cultural. Uh, if, you know, I've heard the comments in more than one way, and I'm just trying to make a point where uh, someone says all the people of a given race, you know, given group, they all look the same to me. Well, that tells me that that you have a cultural expectation. They all look the same. So you really can't differentiate them. And I've heard that between different groups. And I'm not going to get into that any more than that. Past experience. If you have been, heaven forbid, robbed by uh, uh, people of a certain age before and someone comes up, uh, maybe they have uh, something covering their face, but you have a past experience of a certain person or group doing this to you or to other people in the area, you might automatically presume that they're the ones doing it again. Your past experience causes you to think it's the same people. Or maybe you have a personal prejudice, all right? Sometimes individuals turn around, 
who might be, say, seniors, and they see a lot of robbing going on by, by young teens. I mean, even young teens, 12, 13, 14-year-old young teens. And so if a robbery occurs uh, or a purse snatching or something like that, automatically they might assume it's a 12, 13, 14-year-old, even though the truth of the matter is they never really got a good look. These are all ex examples of expectations, past expectations, expectations based on a person's culture or uh, things that uh, you are personally prejudiced to. This here is related to what I was just talking about, and this is the stress element. This here is an example of what is called the yerkes dotson Law of Effect. Developed by Robert Yerkes and John Dotson nearly a century ago, what it basically shows is this, okay? Uh, this is what they call a curvy linear effect. If you look along the very bottom of the chart there, it, you'll see on the x-axis it has the word arousal and from low to high. Arousal basically refers to how energized you are or are not. On the y-axis, you see the word performance, okay? How good are you at something? Now, if you look at the very bottom left-hand corner of this, where you see low arousal and weak performance, imagine lying in bed in the morning and your roommate or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your spouse or a family member says to you, they wake you up. They wake you up. So as far as arousal is very low, you're just waking up. And they say to you, hey, we're, we're going to cook uh, 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 hamburgers for dinner tonight. Don't forget to stop and pick up some hamburger buns and some uh, mustard and ketchup on the way home. And you're laying in bed and you go, okay, that sounds good. All right? Very low arousal. So the chance of, of committing that to memory might be very low, too. You might show up in the afternoon and that person says to you, okay, where's the hamburger buns? Where's, where's the ketchup and the mustard? And you look at them and go, what are you talking about? And they say, I told you this morning to get that. When did you tell me that? I woke you up and told you. Well, low arousal, low performance, okay? As you see on the chart, as arousal increases, the quality of one's performance increases. And this also plays to the idea of memory. Studies and research have shown that if you're more, more awake, more alert, you tend to remember things better. But gets into the curvy linear effect where it starts on a downward. If arousal is way too high, okay, studies find that performance can actually be impaired because of intense anxiety. You actually don't do a good job of committing things to memory and encoding things if your adrenaline is racing. Now, the research has proven this now for a, for a century, and this happens a lot in individuals. They can be very sure that they got the details right, but in reality, not so much. Okay, so anxiety can, uh, uh, stress levels can influence you, but if it turns into anxiety, it can actually be detrimental to your ability to remember. Let me talk here shortly about what is called recall versus recognition. Uh, they are not the same thing by any means. Um, recall, the best way to explain this, recall is the ability to pull things from memory without assistance, without aid. All right? That's recall. Recognition is the process, uh, the physiological sensation or process of saying, I know which one this is. All right? And you can, and you can pick it out. You're given stimuli, you're given items, and you have to pull from memory which is the right item. Uh, one of the best ways I describe the difference between recall versus recognition, if you ever have to take a fill-in-the-blank test or an essay test, that's a lot of recall. You have to pull it from memory without aid. Recognition, a lot of times, is more like a multiple choice test where you turn around and uh, you are given choices, and from those choices, you have to pick which is the right one. You have to recognize which is the proper one. Studies find that, uh, and you probably can figure this out, which tends to be more accurate, all right? Recall with no assistance or recognition with assistance? And the answer is recognition. People are better at recognition than they are recall. This is sort of the difference between being in a situation where you ask someone, describe the, the person that committed the crime, all right? That's recall, all right? When you go to meet up with law enforcement and they give you lots of photos, 
and say, can you pick the person who committed this crime against you from the from the picture ID that we have here, the photo ID lineup, that's example of recognition. Recall is just tell me about it. Recognition, can you pick the person out? Recognition is much more accurate. It really truly is. And this leads us to a discussion of uh, forensic psychology and criminal lineups. We know that uh, recognition is a far better means of memory. So when it comes to doing a lineup, uh, a criminal lineup, what we find anymore is that most police do not use um, actual physical lineups, you know, and stuff like that. Because sometimes you can't get enough people similar to the individual uh, who committed the crime to be fair. All right. You see the joke there of the person throwing the pies. And so, uh, you know, you ask, OK, which one of the people in the physical lineup committed this crime against you? And there you've got a clown and three other individuals that don't look like clowns. So you know, now you know who, who committed the crime. What police and law enforcement are doing, OK, complements of forensic psychology, at least in part anyways, are lineups. And there are really two types. There is what is called a sequential lineup and what is called a simultaneous lineup. If you turn around and you are a law enforcement officer, you're a police officer, and you're working with a, a, a witness, and you lay in front of them several, several pictures, maybe you put six photos down or eight photos down, and you turn around and ask them, which of these six people, which of these eight people committed this crime against you? That is an example of what is called a simultaneous lineup. All of the pictures are put out in front of you all at the same time, and you are asked to pick which one did that. Studies have found that that is not necessarily the best way of doing things, because what sometimes happens is that people will pick the individual who looks the most like the actual person who committed the crime. I say that again. People will pick the individual who looks most like the actual individual who committed a crime. So um, if the individual who committed the crime is not part of the six photos, we have seen in studies that people will turn around and pick the person who looks most like them because they have this mental image that they've got to be in there. So it must be this person. They're the closest to it. A sequential lineup is a little different because with a sequential lineup, what you do is you show the photos uh, to a witness one at a time. And today, currently, one of the things that law enforcement will do is tell a, uh, a witness, I'm going to show you the pictures one at a time. Tell me if you think this individual is or is not the person. And if you're unsure, and think maybe they are, possibly, we'll put them in a separate pile as possibilities. So they may show you a photo, and, and they will also sometimes say, we may go through all six photos or eight photos, and the person may not be in there at all that makes a world of difference. Because if you don't say that little line, people unknowingly start to think, well, it's got to be one of these eight photos. It's got to be one of these six people. So you tell them, we're going to show you one at a time. Tell me if it is or is not a possibility, or if that's the person, or maybe that's the person. All right. And know that it's always possible they're not even in this listing, or this lineup. So they'll show them one at a time. Is this person the one who did it? And the person says, no. They look at it. No, that's not it. So you put that to a side. They show a second picture. Is this the person that committed the crime against you? And they may look at it and go, I don't know. Maybe. So you put that in the maybe pile. You show another one to a person. And, and basically, is this the person? And they may look at it and go, nope, that's not them. And you show another. Nope, that's not them. You show another. Maybe that's them. And you might end up with two or three maybes. And then you use the same approach. You still don't lay them out in front. You let them go through it one at a time and see if they can find it. The research is not 100% clear, but uh, there's some people that argue against it. But the majority of uh, studies say that sequential lineups are far, far better than simultaneous lineups. The last thing I want to talk about is something that might shock you, and it is perfectly legal, and it's what's called a show up. All right. Imagine, uh, well, let me just define it for you. Simply put, a show up occurs when law enforcement catch someone who has committed a crime, who they think might be the 
perpetrator. And so, you know, if, if a crime has happened, someone has been assaulted uh, or had their purse or wallet stolen. And so the police show up and start, you know, scouring the neighborhood looking for, for someone who meets this, this appearance, you know, whatever the person was supposedly wearing. And four blocks later, they four blocks away, they find somebody that sort of meets that uh, looks like the individual in question. You can detain that person, put them in the back of your car, your your uh, police car, drive them over, and let the poor witness say either yes or no, that's them. Okay, that is or that's not them, and that's it. If you happen to be the person wearing uh, a certain piece of clothing that the witness, or excuse me, the perpetrator was wearing, and the police see you sitting out front of your place and say, hey, you know, you look like someone who committed a crime four blocks away. Mind coming over with us? You know, you, you might turn around and say, yeah, I know I didn't commit it, so sure, why not? And they'll may say, well, we're going to put you in handcuffs just to be safe and put you in the back of the car. And you're thinking, well, this is crazy, but I know I didn't do it. I've just been sitting here. They, why, uh, they, they go ahead and tell the people back at the scene of the crime, we think we got them. We're heading over with the person. Puts the mind of a, a witness at ease. And there you are sitting in the back seat of the car. And they look at you. And they actually turn around after looking for a long time and say, yeah, I think that probably is her. Or that probably is him. And guess what? Suddenly you're being charged with a crime. Trust me, that unfortunately has happened. It really, truly has happened. Show-ups where it's either they say yes or no are perfectly legal. It's not like they're being shown seven photos or eight photos. They show just one. And is this the person and so on. A lot of people will say yes. And in fact, the answer is no, it's not the person. But they think that the police have got the bad guy. And so they just turn around and trust them. And they may look in the back and say, I don't know if that's them. Yeah, I guess it's them. And suddenly you're going to jail. It really has happened. In fact, let me give you this example right here of mistaken identity. There was a gentleman by the name of Robert Clauser. He is the picture of the person. He is the person on the left in this picture. Long ago, he was known as the Gentleman Bandit. I believe this was out of Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania, back in the 1970s. He was robbing convenience stores and other places, but he was always very well dressed and very polite. And on one particular time, Robert Clauser was uh, robbing a convenience store. And what basically happened was this. In the process of doing so, things got out of hand. He had a gun and he actually shot somebody. All right. They were not killed, but they were injured. And then he took the money and ran. Law enforcement showed up and the newspaper showed up and the witnesses were asked, OK, did you see the person? Did, and they found out later it was Robert Clauser. They didn't know that. And basically what they said was this when asked what he was wearing. They said the gentleman who robbed us was wearing a black pants and a black shirt and a black jacket, sort of like you'd see on a Roman Catholic priest. So several weeks later, uh, Clauser was apprehended and he was put into the lineup. OK, and they approached uh, area people to be part of the lineup, just to just to be a filler in the lineup. And one of the people they approached was Father Bernard Pagano. He was a Roman Catholic priest uh, who was asked, can you come on down and be part of this lineup? And he agreed. And there he is in the lineup. All right. Taking part in the lineup. And guess what? He's the only one wearing black pants, black shirt, black jacket, and a white collar. And witnesses and others had read that the uh, person that had committed this crime was wearing black pants, black shirt, uh, black jacket, and, and, and so on. They didn't say anything about the collar, but people turned around and actually chose out of the lineup. They didn't let Robert Clauser go. They picked Father Pagano. I said, that's the man. That's the man that 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 shot that poor guy in there. And so here he is in a lineup, all right, just as a filler. And the next thing you know, he's in prison. I believe he was in prison for 14 months waiting trial. And when he went to trial, I mean, uh, Father uh, Pagano, uh, the jury was actually the trial was done. The jury was deciding if he was going to go to jail, if he was the guilty one, yes or no. And as I understand it, Clauser 
actually came forward. He was in jail for another crime, actually came forward in a moment of honesty and said, hey, that trial going on downtown uh, against Father Pagano, he didn't do it. I did it. I'm actually admitting that I did it. And uh, they uh, stopped the trial. They put, pulled the jury back out of their deliberations, told them just wait for now, no more deliberating. And Clouser was brought into the courtroom. And the witnesses turned around and I guess they were in shock and awe as they realized that is the man who committed the crime and realized even more, Father Pagano was not. And so, you know, uh, Clouser was charged with the crime. He admitted to it, all right? And Father Pagano was let free. Um, he spent 14 months in prison and, you know, he didn't do it. But eyewitness identification caused him to spend over a year of his life sitting behind bars. It's really sad.